Hello and welcome to Melco. Mike Doe, part of the applications team, probably hit the mic. Sorry about that. Scott Stingle, my Hello, good buddy. Everybody. And who you can't see off screen today because we don't have a camera on him is our good friend Nate Moore. He is our DJ Mix a Lot. So today we are talking about sewing on thick materials. We want to give you some formulas, um, some, some recipes, I guess we mm -hmm. could call them, right, Scott? Yeah. Um, to be able to sew on thick material. So, questions. Uh, let's, let's get some of this stuff out of the way first before we start showing stuff, start talking about the stuff, give everybody a chance to uh, join us. Um, let us know where you're uh, joining us from. Give us a shout out on the comments. But more importantly on the comments, post your questions about thick materials. We may not have the answer directly to what you're trying to do, but we'll have some uh, key elements that'll be able to hopefully make things successful. So, um, Nate, let's go to the overscreen. And uh, yes, uh, hopefully uh, you guys had made some good comments a couple weeks ago about our new room. We're back in it today. Um, and uh, we, are, we have our white table. We do have a piece of cardboard. Someone made that comment to show things a little bit better, so we'll show that here in a minute. Good. Also, hopefully our sound is better today. Except when you hit your chest. Except <laughs> when I hit my chest. Sorry for that. That was my bad. Um, actually, we'll blame it on Nate. So, uh, Ouch. Anyways, um, let's talk about thick materials. Um, so what we're going to do is let's take a look at one of the materials that um, we're going to be looking at. We're looking at the thickness right now. And so we can see this is a uh, karate belt. Um, to figure out how to best sew on thick materials, and this could be Carhartt jackets, this could be karate belts, this could be um, car mats, um, horse altars, uh, horse blankety things, I'm not sure the X. Oh, saddle pads. Yes, saddle pads. Dog collars. Dog collars, thank you. Um, the formulas to all those is we first need to take and figure out how thick um, our materials are. And I know this probably won't show, but I'm just trying to simulate um, what I'm seeing. So measuring the thickness of this karate belt, I'm measuring it, and it's three millimeters thick. So three millimeters thick, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little a little recipe on our table, which is awesome that I can write on it because, boy, how many times have you written on a table and it was with a permanent marker? <laughs> Not a good idea. Don't do I've it. I've been written up a couple times for that. So <laughs> another story for another time. Anyways, what we're looking at is we want to know our material thickness. Once again, if I misspell something, I really apologize. It needs to be bigger, doesn't it? Let me write it a little bit bigger. Um, public schools didn't do me well with my uh, spelling. Just abbreviate. Wider edge of the, yeah, there you go. Um, so material thickness. And we're, yeah, we're using um, abbreviations. Material thickness is going to equal our minimum stitch length. So let's walk through that again. So if we measure our material thickness, what we're saying is we're not going to let any of our stitch lengths go below that. So in the case of this karate belt, we don't want to go below 30 points. Now let's write one more uh, deal on the table. Um, one point, one point, equals one-tenth of a millimeter. Or another way to put that is 10 points equals one millimeter. So in the case of our <coughs> karate belt, we're looking at 30 points or three millimeters thickness. So if we measure three millimeters, we're going to take and times that by 10, and that's where I get our 30 points. So let's just walk through that once again, because this, this formula, this is where people, and if we could come back to the face room, I apologize. This is where people really get wonky on, um, on thick materials. It happens on hats all the time. We just do more hats than we probably do thick materials, unless you've got a special niche. 
is that we make the stitch, the, the stitch length, that's what's going to lay on top of the material, we make it too small and what happens is if it's not at least the thickness, if it's not at least the length of the thickness, then that stitch is going to cause us a thread break and it's going to be a very bad quality stitch. No matter what machine you're using, um, you know, in the industry, if you're using a home machine, if you're using any commercial machine in the industry, this formula, other than the points um, for active feed, when we get to that, applies to, a, you know, all of our competitors' equipment, anything commercial or home. So it's really important that you get that formula. Yeah, one uh, thought though, uh, the only exception for this that I do uh, and teach is uh, on foam for hats. Yeah. Since you want that to, you know, squeeze, we subtract about five from the 30 for the foam plus the 10 for the hat, right? Okay. And so I would go, uh, you know, 35 instead of 40 on something like can that. Can we go back over screen, Nate? And um, can you take a screenshot of this um, and what we'll do is after the uh, um, session is over today, we'll take and write this up a little bit prettier um, and, and uh, um, take and uh, apologize, I'm looking at my screen and something weird's going on there. Um, uh, taking a picture of this uh, or putting this formula up on the comments so that you guys can write that down. Um, my fat ham was in there, but that's cool. Thank you, Nate. Uh, so this is very, very important. So let's go back to the main screen for a sec. Um, and I'm going to wipe this away for a minute. And so let's talk about, um, I got some karate belts. Uh, there's definitely wholesale places that you can get these at. Um, I don't know all the martial arts. I have mad respect for all of them, uh, like Taekwondo, karate. Uh, jiu-jitsu, um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, of course, that is. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, studios or schools around probably your neck of the woods um, that is looking to have their uh, logo or company name added to a karate belt. And so a lot of people stay away from this because of the thickness, because of how hard it is. Really, this is not that bad to do. And the nice thing is, um, is you can offer this, um, get a couple karate belts, good quality karate belts, make a couple uh, calls to some of the, the local martial arts schools or studios, and take some of them in and show them what you're able to do. Um, and you know, I think we bought this karate belt, I think on Amazon, so not really wholesale, right? Amazon kind of wholesale, but not really wholesale. Um, I think we paid like four or five bucks for this guy uh, and someone told me at a show one time that after they add the personalization, maybe about 10 minutes worth of personalization, they're able to mark it up to about 20 to $25. Um, and you got to remember that, you know, you start out, I think it's white, I don't know, I should go through white this belt, someday, yeah. white belt, mm -hmm. all the way up to like a double shaded black belt <laughs> with a yellow like hockey socky thing on there. I mean, it's <laughs> there's some really cool stuff out there. Mad respect for martial arts. So I'm not trying to ditch any of them, but mm -hmm. I just don't know it. So I, I'm trying to make some jokes about it. Um, good there's stuff. Actually, a customer I had in class uh, has two of these machines and does nothing but karate belts wow. full time. So how did we do this? Um, so we came up with the thickness, um, the minimum stitch, and we'll come back to that here in a minute. But um, I just want to give a plug real quick. Melco Fast Clamp. Um, this guy is really handy. Um, not to say it's not the only way that I can do the karate belt, but man, does it make it a whole lot easier. Um, so if you haven't checked out the Melco Fast Clamp, I highly suggest it, um, suggest it. on uh, For the Love of Melco on uh, Facebook, uh, which is a totally independent uh, Facebook use, uh, user base um, forum or I don't know what they call that thing it's a, a group um, there's a lot of great comments suggestions on how you can use this I mean I learn stuff every day from that group there's just so many great people on that so check that out once again that's for the love of Melco embroidery machines um, and and check out the the Melco fast clamp 
Um, the only complaints that I've ever heard about this guy is, wow, it's expensive. Um, but if you stop and think about it um, and you start understanding what you can do with this and how much easier it makes your life, um, it really has a, a very fast return on investment. Judy uh, just made a shout out on the comments that she is loving hers. Thank you, Judy. Uh, maybe post, Judy, if you got a picture of something that you've done with yours, post that picture in the comments and share it with the group. That'd be awesome. So check out the Melco Fast Clamp. We're going to come back to this guy here in a minute. Um, so let's get back to the formula that we talked about. We talked about the stitch length. So we're going to jump over, Nate, to Design Shop real quick. And so when we do that, um, uh, when we're creating the design, let me just cr open one of my designs up real quick here. What we're looking to do is we can go into uh, our top stitch um, and uh, let me actually go to pull comp. That's where it is. So we can take and set our minimum column width um, to that 30. So we don't have to think about, oh, is that 30 points? We can actually have the design change for us for that. So whatever that thickness is that you came up with, you want to make sure that you set your minimum column width there. Um, and Scott, any thoughts on from the digitizing <coughs> side uh, on doing that? Uh, setting the max, yeah. the, the minimum? No, the, I, I'm more concerned on the underlay, which the underlay? is really important when it comes to garments like this. It's a, Yes. Night and day difference. So right now, like our our uh, uh, we have a zigzag and a border. So are those and two an pretty edge well? Walk. Yeah. Normally, <clears throat> um, you wouldn't think that you would use a zigzag on stable material like this. Normally, it's going to be for knits right. or thick sweatshirts. Right. But what happens is it keeps the stitches uh, from getting so lost in the different uh, the unevenness of the garment itself, especially dog collars and things that are woven. Like yeah nylon there and it doesn't sink so much into the material then right right it keeps okay. the edge better it just does okay so getting back to the settings now this is something that um, might even throw off uh, Nate and Scott I'll take and change the uh, width of the stitch um, of the tie-in and tie-out stitch to that minimum as well because oh, wow. what I find and if we go back to the main screen for a minute <clears throat> what I find is if I've got that set, typically we have tie and tie out somewhere between like six to 10 points. Right. But if we're sewing on 30 point material, every time it goes to do that lock stitch to tie out, I'll get a thread break um, and the thread pulls out of the needle. Well, it's doing that because we're starving the machine for thread. So make sure to change those. I wouldn't do that on, you know, like uh, sweatshirts or heavier garments. But when you're doing heavier products like karate belts, um, we're going to get to uh, car mats, a um, heavy jacket, really look at increasing your uh, stitch length for that, uh, um, the tie-in and tie-outs, okay? So two points that I want to point out that we've talked about. One is, is the minimum stitch length of your design when you're doing thick materials is equal to the thickness of the material. Um, so one point equals a tenth of a millimeter, right? So I measured this out. This is three millimeters thick. So it would be 30 points thick when we get to our minimum stitch length. The second thing is, is make sure that you change the underlay as well okay. as the lock stitches. So and, not just the stitch length. And uh, center out. Center and out, yes. It's just a game changer for keeping the text centered on the garment. In this yeah. case, the belt, dog collars. Can all you that talk stuff. about the the guy who was it that came in? Um, I can't remember the customer's name, but they had something that they were sewing that was really wide. Oh, it was almost ten inches wide. It was yeah. for service dogs. Oh, this okay. was in class a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and they had the fast clamp ten ten inches wide. I mean, this thing was darn close. But they sewed normally left to right, and so what happens is it, the thread gets pushing. It starts okay. drifting off the center of the the collar in this case. Yeah. So if um, what we saw was if this is the uh, let's say this is the collar, and we sew from left to right, um, what was happening as as this was going, it would start waving and drifting off and drifting yes. off like that. Where if we took 
and let's see if I can do this without erasing everything, my fat hands. Um, if you take and set center out, and you sew this direction, um, then it's pushing that material. Like we always talk about, we center out is our friend. No matter if we're doing hats, no matter if we're doing flats, thick materials like this, anytime that we can do center out, that's going to be good. So let's show you in Design Shop real quick. Uh, Scott, can you show us where that's at? Sure. <clears throat> Uh, so under letters, um, we have horizontal stitch order right here. And default is left to right. I think the best is right here. Center out. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Sure. I don't want to forget. But so yep. Do we have a question? Yeah. Ah, great question. So the question is, in case you couldn't hear it, because we only have two mics right now, we're going to get a third one, I promise. Um, the question uh, on uh, Facebook Live, so make sure those questions keep coming in. The question is, is there a maximum thickness that the machine will accept? Um, and safely, you can say that the machine will accept with normal shank needles, um, you can go to four millimeters thickness. Um, so normal uh, shank would be like a DBXK5. We always, on thicker materials, we always want to be using a sharp needle, right? The, the tip needs to be a sharp. Um, but if you go to an SES needle, um, so what an SES needle is, is can we go back over to the... Love having the ability to write. So <laughs> if we have a normal needle and... Thank you for not laughing too hard at my, uh, my pictures. Um, but let's say this is a normal needle. And we look at an SES. KK? Uh, a KK SES, sorry. I, I apologize, yes. Short. Thank you for, so it's short shank. And so it's the needle basically is the same length um, but the shank is smaller. So the reason that they came up with this, and this is a Gross-Beckert thing, so this is uh, um, the reason they came up with this is for 3D foam. So one thing, if, if you're seeing that you're getting a lot of push um, into the foam, uh, it usually is because of the shank itself, especially like on anything higher than like three millimeter or high, you might want to really look at the KK um, needle uh, so that that shank, instead of the foam hitting on the normal, hitting somewhere up here on the KK, it's still the needle before it gets to the shank. So it also makes the machine have to work less to have to push the shank, which is much wider in diameter. Um, so check out KK's. I, I'm sure that uh, um, there's other like, uh, what are the other needles that just slipped my mind, like Schmitz or Organ. I'm sure they have something like this, um, but I'm a big Gross Beckert fan. Um, so yeah, check those out. Uh, but yeah, the, the answer to the question is with the KK, you can go up to five millimeters. With the normal size needle, about four millimeters is your max. Cool. Keep those questions coming. Good questions. Um, Will you be sewing the karate belt, or is that already done? Um, so, due to time limitations, I'll be showing how to sew the karate belt, but we won't actually be sewing one. We can start it up, but we just don't have time in sessions to be able to do that. So, um, this is the karate belt. Let's. Um, can we switch over to the machine real quick? And so right now. I've got a car mat on there, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, remember the rule on the fast clamp is, is we never walk away from the machine with the, uh, the uh, um, arms open or the, the clamp open. Um, so you always want to make sure before you leave the machine to close those. And so what we would want to do is as we look at this guy, there is an adjustment screw. Now let's see if I can bring my hand in. There is an adjustment screw right up here that allows me to adjust the top arm for the thickness of the material. Okay, it's real important that you get that adjustment correctly. You don't want it to be too loose. 
um, and you can actually damage it if it's too tight. Um, I'm going to loosen this guy up a little bit. And another question that I got um, asked by somebody uh, a couple weeks ago that I just want to post here is when we close this guy, you'll notice that the tip of the clamp actually closes before the back does. And the reason for that is um, in any kind of uh, pivot uh, like this, the most weakest point on it um, in strength is going to be the furthest point from where it actually um, pivots off of. So uh, our engineers were smart enough to make this um, angled down slightly. And so then when as it closes, it'll actually, because of the foam in there, it'll take and close up much tightly or much tighter, good English, right? Much tighter against the whole product. So as we put this guy on, we're gonna just take and pull. There's markings on the side. I'm a big fan of like three back. I always try to put it as far back on the clamp as I can. Instead of having it way out here on the edge, try to keep it in as close as possible. And what you're looking for when you close it is you don't want to have to be Hercules with this uh, closer. It should be tight enough that as you pull it, it doesn't slip. And then as you take it on the other side, you want to make sure that you've got it locked in the same position. Adjust your clamp uh, uh, strength on that. Once you have it adjusted for one karate belt, if you're doing multiples of them, you won't need to adjust it for every single one. And then the last thing that I do is um, I'm a very big fan of checking how tight I've got it. So I'll take and just flick it like a guitar string. And if it's more like a thud, um, that is a sign that it's too loose and it's going to get that waving going on. So after I've clamped it, I'll take and just put my thumbs. I don't know if you guys can catch this, but my thumb on there and then I'll just pull on either side. And now I'm actually getting a little bit of a tone from flicking it. So make sure that that's nice and taut in there. Um, and that's how we would tighten it. Um, also, another big question we always get on Melco fast clamps is, how do I know if my design's going to fit inside, um, you know, inside the Melco fast clamp? So as we look on the back of this guy, and it's probably hard to see here, but if you look at one up close in person, um, there's number. So the outside block lines up with that number. And if, Nate, if we could jump over to the uh, um, OS screen for a minute. So you saw, uh, or maybe you couldn't see it because it was so far away, but I had that set at nine. And so by setting this at nine, that will give me my left to right width. Um, if you don't see the Melco fast clamps in your drop down list, what you'll need to do is go to tools. You'll want to go to hoop setup and under hoop setup, you want to go to customize hoop list and then look down through the list to find your Melco fast clamps. That'll go for any of the mighty hoops or anything like that as well. So once you have that set, the next thing you'd want to do is set your material thickness. And what I typically do is I kind of like the rule of thumb of what Scott talked about earlier on the foam. So if we're using three millimeter foam plus the thickness of the garment, let's say it's 10 points, so we're at 40 points, you're going to subtract what? Uh, I subtract five. So subtract five from that. In this case, we don't have foam. We just have three millimeters thickness of karate belt. We would take this up to 25 is how I do that. So the formula on that, if we can jump back over to the main screen. <laughs> Nate's cracking. Nate is cracking up. We must have got a good comment. No, Mr. Ed was a huge part of my childhood. Oh, <laughs> Mr. Ed was a big part of mine as well. He so, was great. Um, if we could show the main screen again. So if our material thickness, yeah, I'm sorry, the, uh, what should we call this? The overhead. The table, yeah. Yeah, the table. So um, if this one, if the material thickness equals, let's call it x, x minus 5 equals our minimum actifeed. All the time? Four thick materials. This is only four 
Good question. Thank you, Nate. <coughs> Thick materials. Okay? So, once again, material thickness equals X. In our case, on the karate belt, that equals 30, right? X equals 30. Down here, 30 minus 5 equals our minimum active feed. So, we'd be at 25. But remember, this rule is only for thick materials. Uh, Carhartt jackets, um, karate belts, uh, dog collars, things like that. This rule works really, really well. Once again, maybe we could take a screenshot of this as well. I won't freak out about the screen this time. Um, and we will write this up and uh, get this put in the comments for you guys. Um, I would take and print this stuff out and I would put it on a wall uh, or put it in a notebook that you've got close to your, um, your digitizing software. But these are really good rules uh, to keep in mind. Yeah. Um... Yeah? It is. That's good. Uh, uh, don't forget that your presser foot kind of goes along with this, right? Oh, you, as presser you're, foot. I, I, if I stole no, your no. show, I'm no, sorry. No, this is good. <laughs> yeah, it's our show. They traditionally go together. So I ran into one the other day. Material thickness was 44 points, and they had the minimum set to six. Wow. As soon as they moved it up, everything was beautiful. Wow. And the presser foot, too. You don't want to beat the presser foot. I mean, it's spring-loaded, but you, you've got to help it. So. Yeah. And, and so something to, to <clears throat> that, um, so presser foot height is really important. There's a couple different ways we can do it. Can we jump back over to the machine? Um, one way is, is we can push this e-stop. This is that round button, um, and it's just barely on the screen. So here's my hand up here in the corner. Um, you press that in. Uh, oh, let me make sure I get my... Uh, wiper blade out of the way, press e-stop. Some of you technicians were just sweating a little bit there as I pushed that and were ready to drop the, uh, the needle. It's now out of the way. And if I reach up underneath, see my hand back here? Uh, if you reach up underneath, there's a silver shaft. Um, that's the Z-shaft. Um, and we can take and drop that down. And once it, we're working on getting a very, very close-up camera so you can see this. But if we reach back, we can take and adjust, as Nate uh, zooms in for me. Thank you, Nate. We can take and adjust the presser foot. But what is the proper height of our, our presser foot? What should, what should our presser foot be? Should it be barely off the garment? Should it be barely touching the garment? Should it be pushing in and causing a dimple into our garment? What do you think that is, guys? You asking me? I'm asking everybody. Oh. Hopefully we get some comments in. Yes. Uh, for me, it depends on how squishy the material is. <laughs> how squishy? Super, if it's super squishy, I'm going to go ahead and squish <coughs> You, you yeah. want to err on the side of a little more than a little less, right? Because right. you don't want air going in there. So if we can go back to the main screen for a minute. If this is our material and this is our uh, presser foot coming down, we want the presser foot to be touching the material if anything, like what Scott and Nate are saying, if anything, have it pressing into it a little bit is okay. Um, what you don't want is you don't want the presser foot sitting off the material. Up, yes. Because what the presser foot's going to do is it's going to come through um, and, and hold the material in place as the needle penetrates it. So it needs to come down and pinch or press it against the, uh, the needle plate on the bottom and the presser foot on top, it needs to hold it in place temporarily for that needle to go through, for the thread on uh, the top thread to go around the hook and create it, and then the needle to go back up, and then the presser foot lifts off. So that's the presser foot's job. If, if you set it too high, it can't do its job, so the material starts flagging, and what <coughs> happens is that oscillation of vibration will go up the thread and cause the thread brake sensor to have a false thread break, a false bobbin break, things like that. It'll also cause the needle to deflect yes. and, and cause a lot of needle breaks. So make sure that you're adjusting those presser feet. Luckily, we only have one on our machine instead of a lot of others that have one for every needle. Adjust them. Make sure that you adjust that presser foot. That was a great point, Scott. Uh, one other quick one. So com common uh, question that we get asked is, Okay, I bought the fast clamp. Uh, my machine is 10 years old. Yeah. And I can't find them, the clamps in the list. Or oh. Mighty Hoops is another great one. 
uh, because the stuff didn't exist when they got their machine originally. So yeah. what do I do? Well, that's a great question. So if we could jump back over to the computer real quick. And I, I know that we're not getting to a lot of these thick materials, and we'll get there. But if I go to melco-service.com, and this is a huge resource. I tell you, mm. um, I use this thing more and more every day. But if I go in here and I type in... Hoop is all that you need. Yeah, if I just type in hoop, great point, Scott. If I just type in hoop, um, I can see that updating the hoop database it's right there so there's information on how to do it I know that this is the latest version of it um, so don't be afraid um, or don't forget I guess it's not that you would be scared to use it but uh, don't be afraid <coughs> don't be hesitant uh, or forget to use the melco-service.com FAQ um, the service team does a wonderful job keeping that up if you find something that isn't there, email them and say, hey, this would be great to have there as a resource. And, you know, unless it's just, you know, uh, something about Star Wars and has nothing to do with embroidery, more than likely they're going to add it to it. So <laughs> not that I don't like Star Wars. I love Star Wars. Dan but, and Nate love them. So yeah. There could be some on well, there. <laughs> how about a Marvel? Do you guys like Marvel? <clears throat> yeah. Captain, or Captain Marvel. Is that what it is? It is. Captain Marvel's coming out this Friday. So, anyways, enough plugs for yeah. movies. Um, uh, while you guys are slightly paused, yeah. uh, kick angles, um, mm -hmm. are they size specific or do they come in a range of sizes? And I need you to review oh. this. Yeah, so the question is, is the KK needles, those short shank needles, um, do they come in different sizes? That's the question. The answer is yes. I know that they come in, or at least what we've used, um, you would never want to use a 60 or 65 or yeah, 70. Right. I think probably 75 is the shortest KK needle that you would want, uh, smallest. or smallest one yeah. that you would want to use. Talking about the shank and the size, and I got mixed up. But yes, the size, 75 is the smallest, and we have them up to a 90. Um, I don't know if Madeira carries those. If they don't, um, give us a comment that they don't, and I'll talk to our friends over at Madeira about carrying those. But the KK needles are really, really good um, on those thick materials as well as what they originally were intended for is, is that uh, 3D foam. Yes, so the, the best needle for foam on a hat would be an 80-12 sharp point mm. KK for the short shank yep. um, and an 80-12 in, in size, chrome plated. We don't want the, uh, the titanium nitride because it, it can make the needle brittle. We want to allow the needle some deflection without snapping so that's the reason for chrome yeah and that's a big change um, in our kind of in our theory um, as over the last couple years about four or five years ago we were really into uh, titanium for caps but as we started watching some uh, um, some high uh, high motion video and watching what the needles doing like Scott said they're very very um, brittle and instead of just deflecting just a little bit, as soon as there was any movement in that needle whatsoever, those titanium needles were busting. Um, so yeah, go just with the non-titanium uh, 8012 sharp. sharp. And if you're doing foam, really check out the, the KK shank. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's go over some different materials and use these um, recipes that we talked about. So the next one, I'm gonna walk off screen for a minute. Okay. Uh, oh, they're right here forgot where I put everything so next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna do a dog collar um, once again there's probably a ton of places that wholesale these I don't have the information um, on that um, I'm sure if you posted some comments hey folks where can I get these there's people out there that can tell you where to get wholesale dog collars I bought these on Amazon I think these guys were like five bucks also and so we'll open one up and just kind of talk through our formulas on it. So this is the dog collar itself. Um, important things about digit or embroidering on new products is make sure you understand how the product's going to be used. Um, because I don't know how many times I've seen, uh, you know, a dog walking down the street, and someone's done a really good job with the embroidery, but they forgot 
that this is where it gets adjusted. And so they center the embroidery here instead of putting the embroidery close to the side that doesn't get adjusted. And half the phone number or half the dog's name is underneath the, uh, um, uh, the adjustment. So make sure that you understand that. The other thing that I would do is um, as you're looking around at Goodwill for scrap shirts and stuff, look for some webbing because you don't want to take a $5 product and test on that. Use um, some you know, cheap webbing that is about the same thickness and make sure that your formula is correct. So if we look at this and we use our formula, Scott, mm -hmm. um, if I look at this guy, he's about one millimeter thick. Um, so if I do my formula again, you don't have to write this each time, but I'm just doing it so that you guys are following me. So my material thickness equals 10, 10 points. Yeah, if you don't mind. And so if that's my material thickness, then my minimum stitch length should be no less than 10 points, okay? Um, and then my active feed setting on the dog collar is going to be five points. And the reason for that is, let's just do that real quick here. We're gonna take our, um, material thickness uh, minus five points equals minimum stitch length, right? Or I'm sorry, minimum active feed. Cool. And I know this is a lot of um, a lot of details in talking about um, these things, but I, I really want to emphasize, and most importantly today, I want to give you a tool, or we want to give you a tool, that makes you successful on these heavy products. Um, without this, you're, you're, you're floundering. So if you have a customer that walks in and says, you know, I want the Constitution of the United States put on this dog collar, you need to politely tell them that that's not possible. You definitely need to educate them. Yeah, and, and so it's always good to have some samples laying around or have with you if you're going somewhere and saying, you know, really on this material, this, uh, this dog collar is an inch wide. Really, the, probably the minimum that we would want to do on here, height-wise, is probably going to be no, no smaller than about a half an inch. Yeah, right. Um, and we want to make sure that our width of our uh, lettering is at least 10 points wide. Um, and in my opinion, the thicker the better for this um, so that someone can see it, you know, 20 feet away. Because I don't know about your dog, but my dog doesn't like strangers. So if, if she got lost, I want somebody to be able to read it from a distance <laughs> and not get bit by my dog. So that's, that's another reason why it would be good to be big. But you know, you might have a small dog. I've got one of those too. Um, you know, usually the, the webbing's a little bit thinner on those um, smaller dog collars. You can go a little bit thinner, um, but once again, keep in mind the readability and don't be afraid of educating your customer. Yes, the customer is always right, but sometimes they need to be educated on how to be right even better. So dog collar, um, that's, our, that's our information on that. Let's go over to the machine. And so, oh, I just broke my rule. I don't know if anybody saw that. Hopefully they didn't. Nobody caught me. <laughs> Nobody saw that. Um, so once again, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take and make sure that I'm doing it on the right, right side. So I definitely don't wanna do the side that's got the tag on it, right? So I open this guy up. I'm gonna pull, uh, pull the dog collar in to my marking of, I'm gonna do four on this guy. And make sure that I adjust the screw 
um, the adjustment screw on the clamp so that it's holding it correctly. And then I'm going to pull it to the same side or same mark on the other side and adjust that screw. Um, on this one inch design, that would probably be the smallest. Um, but if you were doing a smaller collar, let's say it's like a half inch thick, um, you would want to look at what's appropriate for that. Um, probably a smaller dog, you might want to do a quarter of an inch. So it's going to be based off of it. What you definitely don't want to do is you don't want to go smaller in height than what your minimum stitch length is, because then you're conflicting that too. So know that those two eventually will hit together but if the dog collar is thinner or the product that you're working on is thinner and requires a smaller text or smaller object you can do that just make sure you're staying at or above your minimum stitch length so if if we listen to this i'm gonna be real quiet um, there is no strum to that whatsoever so i'm going to take and tighten that up and now I've got myself a strum. Remember that we're digitizing from center out on this lettering. The other thing that I'll do, if we can switch over to the design shop for a minute, is if we bring up a design, and I think on this one we were doing Fido. Let's see if I can find Fido real quick. The size of arms that I'm using are the medium size. I have a tendency to use those more than any of the other ones. Is this, that's the belt. I think it's under downloads or desktop. I don't know what I did with Fido. <laughs> Poor guy. Um, and I sewed them this morning. You would think that I would have had it right there in downloads. Um, anyways, what I'm going to do, we'll just use this name, uh, Brianna. If I take and turn the crosshair on on her, Oops, there it went. Let me open up Design Shop real quick here. Hold on one second. And my computer has decided to do an update or is frozen <laughs> right now. So let's go back to Don't the main walk. screen. Um, so what we want to do is, and we'll use the overhead. Yeah, no problem. I would measure, so our dog collar, we're just going to say this equals one inch, okay? Um, what we want to do in Design Shop, if we pull up our crosshair with our um, embroidery on it, uh, that crosshair represents where the laser is going to be um, when we put it over to the machine, okay? So if we take the text, and we take and put the crosshair to where the horizontal line is right at the very top or centered. I'm doing this wrong. I apologize, guys. Let me get this out in words. Um, so if this is our border. This is the actual width of the dog collar. If we set that horizontal line of the crosshair to here, so it's right at the top. When we go over to the machine, we can actually have that laser shine at the very top of it, and that will center the text on the collar. So instead of trying to figure out what center at the machine, all we have to do, if we put design in Design Shop this way, that will make the text center. Yeah, so. You could do it on the bottom as well, yep. Yeah, you would, the laser would be, uh, in Design Shop, your design would be, uh, a half an inch down from the top. Correct. That works so good instead of having to try and make sure you're centered on the dog collar. Yeah, uh, and let's see, see if it. we can show that here. We do it at the shows on the uh, yep. well, you guys are working on stuff. key rings. Um, would you, uh, sorry, can you explain how you decide which size arms to use? Yeah, so, um, and we come main screen again. The, the big thing that I look at is to be honest with you, I use, I always start with using the middle size arms. Um, the long arms I, I typically would use for if I'm doing something really deep, um, like so for right. example, 
We haven't gotten to this yet, but we need to, and I know we're getting really long on time. If I was going to sew a design that was um, in the middle of this carpet, I would put the long arms on. So it kind of depends on how far in or how big of a design I'm doing with the um, fast clamp kind of dictates which arms I'm going to use. How much and where you need support. Y yes, so how much and where I need the support is also going to dictate that. So thank you, Nate. You've given, given me proper, proper terms. Um, so yeah, that, that's a very good point. But if we can go back real quick to design shop. So what we were just talking about is originally we had this text where it was centered on the horizontal crosshair. So that's this red line. And what we did is we grabbed the text and we just pulled it down and we could take and pull it down a certain amount so that it centers itself. But it's so much easier to set your design up in design shop, don't you think, Scott? Yes. And you can either turn on the grid and do it that way or um, you can actually uh, move the text down right through. Yeah. Yeah. So use, use that rule as well. Um, that rule is really good. Like if you look at the embroidery on my pocket, um, you know, I've got four of these shirts and they're exactly the same right. amount. Uh, they're about a quarter of an inch off the top of the pocket every single time and centered. So not only did I use that tip that Scott taught me on, on setting that in design shop, but also use the laser um, alignment um, to be able to make sure that I'm in between those two spots and I'm straight. Yes. So, okay, let's move on. Let's, um, let me bring up my cardboard so we're not looking at stuff on a white table. So um, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about car mats. Um, car mats are a really fun thing to do as well. And this is something that opens you up to car clubs. It opens you up to auto shops. Um, you know, there's a lot of things. And, and once again, these uh, I bought from, guess where, Amazon. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of good ones at Walmart, AutoZone. Uh, that's not Checkers anymore. It's O'Reilly, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, and so the big thing about car mats is if we look at the back, and maybe we can come over to the uh, machine zoom in. And we've got these knobs on the, um, on the back of the carpet. What we're going to do, um, Scott, there's a, a razor blade over there. I think it's below the blankets. Um, yep, there you go. So what I do is I get a window scraper. Um, you can get these at, at Walmart or um, you know, auto parts stores too. And what I'll do is wherever I'm going to put my embroidery, wherever I'm going to do embroidery, I'll take and shave off those nubs. Mm -hmm. um, because what we don't want to do is these nubs uh, underneath are going to pull differently um, the thread where it ties and it could potentially cause some really bad issues um, in the quality. Um, you don't have to just do text on these. You could do logos. Um, you know, you could do, if you have permission, you can do different uh, car manufacturers, car club uh, logos on these. Um, it's a really cool way to, to add personalization and find a new niche that maybe nobody uh, in your area has thought about offering to, uh, to, uh, to car clubs or auto shops. So thoughts yeah. on that? Here's where uh, you want to keep things thicker, right? Because you're going to lose a lot of width inside of the, the thicker napped fabrics. Yeah. Um, so this is sort of uh, the poster child for the primer stitch, ah, really, right? And we yeah. talked about, Samantha talked about the primer Yeah, uh, Sam did that about a month ago, right? To uh, yep. slam down the, the nap of the fabric. Uh, we did a logo on this that this, it was really thick uh, carpet, remember yep. a bunch of years ago? And so uh, we took black and actually did almost a full density fill because the the, the uh, nap was so the, oh it was yeah. yeah very thick and we ended up using uh, thick um, topping on it also hmm. because small letters you know no matter how much underlay or feed or whatever you do they're still going to get lost in the grass right unless you can uh, put them up and the people don't notice if it's the garment color um, for the, the the primer stitch right yeah, so once again, if we were going to do a project on a carpet, our first step would be is to measure the thickness of it 
and use our formula to make sure that we're within our minimum stitch length and what our minimum active feed setting should be. So given you the tools to do it, um, after this session, now you need to use those tools and do it, okay? So car, carp car carpets, possible. <laughs> um, we talked about dog collars, possible. Um, next is, yeah. oh, sorry. <laughs> um, next is the actual horse jumper, saddle pad, saddle pad thingy jigger. So I got to tell a funny story. I went to a tack store. I am not a horse guy. Um, and so I go in and I tell the lady, I need a horse altar. <laughs> and she's like, she starts laughing at me. It's a horse halter, oh, I'm sir. I'm going to get married. Yeah, I, like I was going to get married at the <laughs> horse halter. So anyways, funny thing. Um, these are wonderful to sew on too. Uh, we've got a lot of people here in Colorado, um, like especially around the stock show time, they'll do tons and tons of personalization on product like this. Um, pretty thick. This one is uh, kind of a quilted cotton, but I've seen people use wool ones. Mm -hmm. um, and so this guy here... Scott was able to take this. Go ahead, Scott, show that off. Yeah, you can see. Uh, yeah, I guess this is good enough. Legion Fields this is a logo I've brought. Well, maybe bring it over here to the close-up okay. camera. We've, uh, I've used this for uh, digitizing uh, Facebook sessions and all that stuff. This, it's cool. Nate designed a logo means absolutely nothing. There is no company that we know of because we needed a, you know, a non-trademarked logo. Um, but very easy to uh, sew. Uh, one other quick point too is sometimes it can be difficult measuring the thickness of fabrics with a, a millimeter ruler. Yeah. So uh, what we did that works out really good is we went to Harbor, Harbor Freight, Freight. Yeah. Yep. And for you bought them. Oh, like seven bucks. Seven dollars. You can get uh, a pair of calipers that are digital. So uh, I could go get one before yeah. we finish, and I'll show yep. you. Basically, uh, you you know slide it, and you get exact measurements and it gives you a readout so you know there's yeah, no it, guessing. Yeah, I mean, if it, that would be a, a pretty good investment if uh, you were going to do a lot of thick materials um, to <clears throat> instead of trying to measure. That's a great point, yeah. Scott, to have a set of those calipers. Um, so, yeah, so uh, this guy here, this material here, um, I would probably suggest using like a Mighty Hoop on, um, and that will actually bring me to a, a black. Um, this is a Dickies jacket, but it's the duck canvas like what? Um, Carhartt jackets are. Um, so we use the Mighty Hoop on this um, and we'll bring it over here um, as well because I'm loving having this close up that camera. Is nice. Oh, which way do I go? Okay, there we go. Um, so you can see how nice of a job uh, this guy is able to do. This has got that quilted interior and once again we, we just did our recipe. You know, what is the thickness of the material? Um, and, and all that. So make sure that you use that and it's, it's definitely doable. You could use a normal hoop on this as well, um, but it's, it's, you're gonna, your wrists after doing about six or seven of them, you're gonna be taking some Advil or something at night because your wrists are gonna hurt so bad where, yeah, plus you're gonna get hoop burn where with this guy, um, literally, it, that's how easy it is to hoop it. Now, obviously this one's already sewn, but I'm just trying to show how easy it is. The other thing about this is, is uh, Nate sewed this up for me this morning um, and he used the laser alignment on it. So you don't have to worry about being perfect with your, your hooping. Um, you can always take and put a piece of uh, painter's tape down that's straight so you can have someone put the jacket on, make sure it's straight because there's nothing worse than crooked embroidery. I'm sure there is something worse, but that's what I was thinking of. So. Yeah, you can do this. Um, and then probably the most thickest thing that I've done to date, and I haven't had a chance to sew this guy up yet. Um, this is two thicknesses. So if we can come over to here, and I think I have the right part. Yes, right? Okay. So you can sort of see if I shine it up like that, you can see that it's two thicknesses um, of webbing. So. This guy was like 50 bucks at the, uh, um, uh, at the tax store. And so if you stay in for a minute, what I did um, before when I was practicing is I took some just normal webbing and I just found what that thickness was. In the case of this stuff, it was about four thicknesses of this webbing. And I test sewed on this stuff instead of 
trying to go right on to the product. So don't be afraid of doing a test soap before um, if the product is, is super, super thick and or super, super expensive. It's, it's never a bad idea to do that and it's also a good idea to build in that time and cost to the cost to the customer. Um, you know, personalization on a horse uh, halter, even though, you know, let's say we we're putting Mr. Ed on this guy, um, I probably would be in the neighborhood of about, not for the horse halter itself, but just for the personalization, I probably would be in the neighborhood of about $20 up to do the, uh, the personalization on this product, where if I put Mr. Ed on my shirt um, and they provided me the shirt, that probably would be more like five bucks. So don't be afraid of building in the cost to that as well. So you had that, that uh, Yeah, I got the calipers just to give everyone a quick look at where we're going over here. You want to go over here? Right. Uh, you yeah, they're not bad at all. You don't need the finest pair of machinists. Uh, right. You know. Nate, do we have any questions? Yeah, so before you guys um, wrap this up, uh, weren't we using the same sharp KKs on everything? Um, on the thick materials, yes. So the question was, is were we using the sharp KKs on all these different uh, thick materials that we showed today? And the answer is yes. Um, you probably, other than the horse halter, um, not alter, halter, um, you probably wouldn't need the KK. You could probably just use a, a DBX K5, a regular normal shank. Um, but for that horse halter, we're up at that probably five millimeter thickness. Um, and so, yeah, we would want to use that for that. But I just left the KKs on there for everything that we sewed. Well, guys, I really appreciate it. Um, I want to just do a couple shout outs to some teasers that we got coming up. First of all, in two weeks, we will be at the Atlantic City uh, ISS trade show. Um, we actually have a mixed media class workshop going on. Um, so if you're coming to ISS, check that class out. Uh, John LeDrew, I believe, also has one on direct to garment printing, adding that to your shop. Um, and I'm doing one on applique and 3D foam. So would love to see you guys' faces there. If you're not able to make it um, to one of those classes, come down to the booth and say, hi, I'll be at that show. And then the very next week, uh, my friend Scott will be at the MBM show in um, Irving, Texas, and would love to have you guys swing by and say hi. Um, the next couple weeks of Facebook Live, next week we'll be doing one on selecting the correct needle. Um, so That'll be a wonderful one to watch. Um, and then the following week, by request from Facebook listeners, um, Scott will be doing a digitizing along uh, class that will actually provide you the art and we'll walk through together with you guys on um, digitizing that design. Um, so can't wait for those things. Really appreciate everything that you guys uh, do for us. Um, if you have any thoughts, comments on future classes or future Facebook Live sessions that we should be thinking about doing, please send those our way. And uh, yeah, keep doing what you're doing and thanks for being a Melco customer.